Did you commit to another CPA review course that just isn't aligned with how you learn? Well, spilled milk, baby. In the world of accounting, only one figure matters, and that's the bottom line. So by investing in Universal CPA Review, you're investing in yourself, and we promise to do everything in our power to get you the ROI that you're looking for by obtaining your CPA license. We know that purchasing a CPA review course is an investment, and we also know that spending all that money on a program that hasn't worked out sucks, and we want to soften that blow. Our Spilled Milk program will allow you to commit to Universal's Visual Learning CPA Review program at a steep discount. So reach out to info at universalcpareview.com to learn more about our program and what discounts you qualify for. The engagement letter is the first step in an audit engagement. Think of this as outlining everybody's responsibilities and the scope of the engagement. All right, it's also going to include various other details related to the engagement itself. As we mentioned previously, it is critical that we understand the flow of the audit engagement. So before we start memorizing our way through these concepts, let's first understand the intuition behind it. Okay, so as we mentioned, this is the first phase when conducting an audit. So there are two primary letters in an audit engagement. All right, and there are three total documents that we really need to consider. So you need to make sure that you understand the written context within these documents. We need to understand the differences in the engagement letter and the management representation letter. So the engagement letter can be thought of as the initial contract with the audit client. So this is one of our key professional documents to consider. So as we're going through this, in the back of your mind, you need to be considering the differences in the engagement letter versus the representation letter versus any audit documentation. Okay, and reason being is because the context of each of these documents will all sound very similar. At the Prometric Center, when you're taking these exams and you see a question, you want to avoid thinking, this sounds very familiar, I know this, but I just can't quite remember. Does this have to do with the engagement letter, management representation letter, or could this have to do with audit documentation? Right? If you're memorizing this stuff, it's all going to sound very similar. So let's break this out. We have the engagement letter and the management representation letter. These are our two primary letters. When you think about audit documentation, the context within this is going to be what the auditor documents throughout the actual engagement itself. So let's start by talking about the engagement letter. And the reason is because the engagement letter, as we said, is going to be written and signed at the beginning of the engagement. All right, so it only makes sense to start here, whereas the management representation letter will be written and signed at the end of the engagement when conclusions related to the audit report have been reached. So the overall purpose of the engagement letter is for the auditor, right, Detective Lucy over at Palmer CPA and their client, Max, over at Accrual World, first coming to terms with the scope of the engagement, which will include the overall timing and the ability for Palmer CPA engagement staff to meet expectations. So this stems off of what we talked about when it comes to audit firm quality control standards. Right, we remember Palmer CPA firm and the six elements of quality control. So that's the rule book for the audit firm. And when you're thinking about those six elements, we remember the A in our Palmer mnemonic. So this is client acceptance and engagement continuance. And that, my friends, is what we're talking about when we're talking about the engagement letter. Okay, so the auditor must first determine whether or not they will even be able to perform the work. So what are the factors that will be considered when making this determination by the auditor? The auditor must first consider factors such as deadlines that need to be met. So in order to understand deadlines, they must first understand the overall timing and how complicated this client might be to audit. Right, when it's all said and done, we want to understand the firm's ability to meet these reporting deadlines. Okay, so again, reverting back to quality control standards, we addressed the client acceptance and continuance element of quality control. Right, we remember that one of the key elements that the exam loves to test when it comes to client acceptance is the understanding of whether or not the client's management lacks integrity. So something you must understand during the acceptance phase is that the audit firm should always, always, always minimize the likelihood of associating themselves with a client whose management lacks integrity. Okay, we really press that in our quality control lecture. So at a high level, we say that we want to limit our likelihood of associating with shady clients. But more specifically, we're now going to drill down what are some examples of what makes a shady client. Okay, and how can we ensure that we are not associating ourselves with one of these shady clients? Well, they need to look at their past reputation. Okay, so the auditor wants to know who's working in key management positions. And this is ultimately going to help the auditor, right, Detective Lucy, 
in understanding if this is an engagement that might lead to high risk, which will ultimately increase the likelihood that the financial statements will be misstated. Okay, and that's going to lead to the auditor doing more work and setting themselves up for a liability. The next question that the audit firm will need to ask themselves is, will they have enough members to staff the engagement? If they don't have enough staff, they might not be able to do the job. So they not only need to consider the quantity of staff members, but also the quality, right? This is something that the human resources department is going to do within the elements of quality control, right? Thinking about our R in our Palmer mnemonic. So if the auditor is auditing a complicated industry, they might want to look into staffing it with members who have industry experience. And if they don't have that, then they might need to look outside the organization and bring in a specialist. All right. And we emphasized independence. Okay. So the auditor must remain independent when auditing a client. All right. And ultimately it's paramount that the auditor remains independent and understands what might threaten their independence to the client, because this is a requirement when issuing an audit report, regardless of whether we are auditing a private or public company. And ultimately, that is what we will be considering when accepting the engagement and signing that engagement letter. So that's the engagement letter at a high level. And now that we understand how it all comes full circle, let's break out what the exam might actually ask related to this topic. So just like we always need to do, we're going to once again think about this in a systematic way, a step-by-step -step so that we can give ourselves a menu of options and we're not pulling our hair out trying to remember the differences in the engagement letter versus the representation letter versus audit documentation versus whatever. Okay, the audit exam has a lot of context. It's very conceptual and it can be convoluting. So even though this is not a mathematical exam and we don't need a systematic way to remember formulas per se, we still need a systematic approach when remembering the concepts. All right, so when in doubt, map it out. We're going to apply our mental map and this is a high level roadmap for breaking out what it is they can ask specific to the engagement letter. So the questions we want to ask ourselves within our mental map when thinking about terms of the engagement or the engagement letter consist of, is this a first time audit or a recurring audit? What if there's a scope limitation before accepting the engagement? What is actually written in the engagement letter? And what are the reasons for changes in the engagement? So firing this up by thinking about the details when accepting the engagement. If this is a first time audit, AKA an initial audit engagement, or is this a recurring audit engagement? So an initial audit engagement is exactly what it sounds like. This is the first time that Detective Lucy and Palmer CPA firm is taking on this client. We've never audited them before. So this might be a little bit challenging if we are unfamiliar with the client's financial statements. If we don't know what's up with their management team, or if we are not even familiar with the industry or the business, it could be a little bit more challenging or a little bit more of a struggle to first understand this stuff. Whereas a recurring client is if Lucy and Max know each other pretty well at this point, because Lucy's been leading the engagement team for the audit of a cruel world for many years now. Okay, so much more straightforward process when this is a recurring client engagement. We're much more familiar with the client now. So a lot less pregame work is going to go into this situation, right? You need to know the differences between the two and some of the characteristics that apply to each. So starting with first time audits and the first thing that the new auditor will have to do is make inquiries to the predecessor auditor. Okay. So what is a predecessor auditor? What is a successor auditor? Well, let's start from scratch. Let's identify what the word predecessor and successor actually means. Our friends over at Merriam Webster dictionary define predecessor as a noun and as a person who held a job or office before the current holder. Okay, whereas a successor is still a noun, and this is a person or thing that succeeds another, right? This comes after something else. So tying this back to the material, a predecessor auditor is an auditor that audited this client before us. So Lucy and Palmer CPA is going to be considered the successor auditor if they are auditing the client this year and another auditor audited the client in the previous year. So when we need to make inquiries to the predecessor auditor, what Detective Lucy is going to have to do is reach out to the predecessor auditor, but only after the client has given her permission to do so. Okay, so that's something that they love to test. The successor auditor must first ask permission to make inquiries to the predecessor auditor. So if this is a requirement, what's going to happen if the client refuses to give the successor auditor permission to chat with the predecessor auditor? So in a situation where this is an initial audit and we haven't even accepted the engagement yet, and the client refuses to let us speak with the predecessor auditor, 
then we should consider withdrawing from this engagement. All right, but let's say all goes well, all goes according to plan, and the client lets us speak to the predecessor auditor. The next thing we should understand for initial audits is what questions that we should ask the predecessor auditor. Well, before we accept the engagement, we should understand any disagreements between management and the predecessor auditor regarding audit procedures and accounting principles. Right, if the previous auditor had a disagreement with management, we want to know what happened there. Right, was this the previous auditor's fault? Or maybe management might lack integrity. Okay, it's like talking to somebody's ex. We want to get to the bottom of understanding, is the ex a little bit salty? Right, maybe they left them for Palmer CPA? Or maybe there's something we don't know about Max at Accrual World. Right, maybe there's something a little bit funky about him. That's what we want to know before we accept the engagement. We also want to know relevant information that could affect management's integrity. All right, so that kind of snowballs into what we just talked about. All right, we want to know if Max lacks integrity. That's going to come from this conversation. We want to know why this relationship ended. What are the reasons for the change? Is it because Max broke up with the previous auditor? Or maybe the previous auditor wanted to separate from Max? Okay, we also want to know any communication with management or the audit committee regarding fraud or non-compliance with relevant laws and regulations. Okay, they need to remain objective when they give us this information. All right, if there was some sort of non-compliance or some sort of communication that was pertinent regarding fraud, that's something we at Palmer CPA want to know. All right, so if there's an initial audit, there's going to be plenty of pregame work going on here. We want to understand who it is that we're about to work with as a client. Whereas recurring audits, naturally, won't have as much pregame work going on here. So if this is a recurring audit, this means that we conducted the audit for this client last year. All right, so as we mentioned, not as much pregame work going on here. So the auditor should simply assess whether circumstances require that the terms of the audit engagement need to be revised. Right, we have this contract that we already signed with them last year. Are we making changes to the contract going forward? Or are revisions to the contract unnecessary? All right, so what the exam wants you to know is what are some applicable reasons for revisions to be made? So revisions to the terms of the engagement are typically due to changes in senior management, misunderstandings regarding the scope of the engagement, changes in ownership of the company. It could be due to changes in regulation or changes in the nature or size of the business. All right, this is all going to impact the engagement itself. So in this case, revisions to the engagement letter would need to be made. All right, so the next thing we need to ask ourselves, what if there's a scope limitation prior to actually accepting the engagement? Okay, so scope limitations are going to be a situation where we can't do our job as the auditor. This could lead to a reason for issuing a qualified opinion or a disclaimer of opinion if the scope limitation was discovered when conducting the audit. But for whatever reason, we have now determined that we cannot do our job before accepting the audit. Okay, so within this agreement, what is it that is management's responsibility? So Max's responsibility over at Accrual World is for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements and making sure that they are in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. So the applicable financial reporting framework can be U.S. GAAP, but it doesn't always necessarily have to be. So U.S. GAAP is what we call the general purpose framework, but it can also be a special purpose framework. Right, it could be the cash basis, the tax basis, the regulatory basis of accounting. If that is the case, then that needs to be disclosed. And the financial reporting framework will include various factors, such as the entity's nature. Right, is this a nonprofit organization? Is it a for-profit organization or a government organization? Okay, so it could depend on the nature of the financial statements. Right, are we auditing the complete set of financial statements, or are we just auditing a single statement? All right, and finally, the regulations behind the framework. All right, so what are the specific laws and regulations when reporting in accordance with a special purpose framework versus the general purpose framework? All right, so management making this acknowledgement that it is their responsibility for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements and ensuring that they are in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework needs to be disclosed. They also need to disclose that they are responsible for the design, the implementation, and the maintenance of internal controls that are relevant to the preparation and fair presentation of those financial statements. All right, and now reverting back to a possible scope limitation that might arise prior to accepting the engagement. We remember within the context of the engagement letter that management should acknowledge that it is their responsibility to provide the auditor with access to all necessary information to conduct the audit engagement. 
Okay, so at this point, we have come to terms with management, right? They have agreed to let us audit their financial statements. But what happens when coming to terms with the engagement that Max at Accrual World prevents Detective Lucy at Palmer CPA from performing procedures or having access to certain documents? Okay, so if Lucy needs to test for completeness and needs to view the sales orders or needs access to their bank statements when taking a look at their cash balance and management prevents them from viewing those documents, that is something that's going to prevent Lucy from doing their job, which would be considered a management-imposed scope limitation, right? So prior to accepting the engagement, right, prior to signing off on the engagement letter, management refuses to acknowledge that it is their responsibility to allow the auditor to view certain documents or do their job in whatever capacity they need, then that's going to be an issue that needs to be addressed. So the exam wants to know how the auditor should respond to this situation. And the answer is going to be that it depends. So we have a high level mental map, but now we're going to create a mini mental map for this specific situation, because there are a couple of scenarios that need to be considered. Okay, so normally when you think about scope limitations, the first thing that needs to come to your mind is qualified opinion or disclaimer of opinion. And that's correct. All right, but again, this is a situation where a scope limitation has arised prior to accepting the engagement. So when addressing this, the ultimate question that you need to ask yourself is, is this scope limitation pervasive? Right, we remember when issuing an audit report, if a scope limitation is considered material but not pervasive, we would issue a qualified opinion. If it was considered both material and pervasive, then we would issue a disclaimer of opinion. All right, so the general rule in a situation where a scope limitation arises prior to accepting the engagement, and that scope limitation is considered pervasive, is that we should not accept the engagement. All right, so if the scope limitation is considered pervasive, and before accepting the engagement, we already now know that we're probably going to have to issue a disclaimer of opinion because of this issue, then the auditor should not accept the engagement at all. All right, unless, and this is a big unless, that engagement is required by law. In which case, we will accept the engagement and we will go ahead and issue that disclaimer of opinion. Okay, so if you see a situation where the scope limitation prior to accepting the engagement is pervasive, you're thinking same opinion, same disclaimer of opinion is getting issued. Nothing is changing here. And again, that is only if it is required by law. If it's not required by law, we're not accepting the engagement. Scenario number two, what if the scope limitation is considered material, but not pervasive, right? In a normal world, we're going to be issuing a qualified opinion, right? If this was something that was detected after accepting the engagement, that would be the necessary opinion that would be issued. But again, this is an alternate situation where we have discovered the scope limitation prior to even accepting the engagement. And if that scope limitation is considered material, but not pervasive, what are we going to do as the auditor? Well, we could still accept the engagement, we're just going to go ahead and issue that qualified opinion. Okay, so just to recap at a high level, our mini mental map, we're going to be issuing an opinion as we normally would under two scenarios. If the scope limitation is considered material but not pervasive, no difference from discovering this during the actual audit. We're still going to accept it and issue a qualified opinion. If it is considered material and pervasive and it is required by law, no difference once again. We're going to accept it and issue a disclaimer of opinion. All right, but if it's not required by law, then we should not accept the engagement if it is considered material and pervasive. All right, so that's what we need to understand under this unique situation, something that they do love to test when it comes to the terms of the engagement and one of our core elements in our mental map. All right, we need to understand if a scope limitation arises prior to accepting the engagement, the two different scenarios, and how the auditor should respond. Okay, so the next question we need to ask ourselves, what is written in the engagement letter? So this is the context itself. The exam does test what is actually reported within the engagement letter. And the AICPA outlines this list of things that need to be included in the terms of the engagement. All right, so while yes, it is important to understand these, and sure, memorizing every single one of these isn't going to hurt your chances. But instead of just memorizing this list, let's understand intuitively and at a high level why it makes sense to include the context in this engagement letter. Okay, so first and foremost, the engagement letter should outline the overall objective and the scope of the audit. What is it that we're trying to get done here and how much work is actually going to be performed? All right, we need to outline responsibilities. What are the responsibilities of Detective Lucy and her engagement staff? What is Max's responsibility and his team over at Accrual World? 
So the responsibilities of the auditor and the responsibilities of management both need to be disclosed. Okay, so the management responsibilities, we remember, is to prepare financial statements in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework and for the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls. The auditor is responsible for planning and performing the audit, right? They want to obtain that reasonable assurance. They're responsible for assessing risk of material misstatements before performing the test of details and for expressing an opinion on the financial statements. Okay, so we need to disclose a statement that because of the inherent limitations of an audit, coupled with the inherent limitations of internal controls, there is this unavoidable risk that certain material misstatements may not be detected, even though the audit is properly planned and performed in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. Okay, so if Accrual World is a massive client with tons and tons of inventory, it's going to be possible that we don't count every single item or every single unit that is reported as inventory. Okay, so if there's a ton of cash transactions coming and going in and out of the system, there is the possibility that we are unable to detect whether cash has been misappropriated, right, stolen from the company. So those are inherent limitations that no matter what, we just can't control. So because of those inherent limitations, we're basically documenting that there is this risk that we won't uncover everything. All right, we need to identify the applicable financial reporting framework. All right, so if the financial statements are reported under GAAP, then that needs to be disclosed. There needs to be reference to the expected form and content of any reports to be issued by the auditor and a statement that the circumstances may arise in which a report may differ from its expected form and content. Okay, so some of the additional contents that can be reported in the engagement letter that have been tested in the past consist of the following. Elaboration of the scope of the audit, including reference to the applicable legislation, regulations, generally accepted auditing standards, or ethical requirements. Okay, so anything at a high level that has to do with the scope of the audit is going to be included in this engagement letter. All right, we need to document the form of any other communication of results of the audit engagement. Arrangements regarding planning and audit performance, including the composition of the audit team. Right, this is basically us telling the client, this is what we would need when performing and planning the engagement. All right, we should document the expectation that management will provide written representations. As we mentioned, that's something that is going to come up at the end of the audit engagement. That's our other primary document. And that is something that's going to be written and signed by management. All right, so we should also document the agreement of management to make information available to the auditor in a timely manner. When performing substantive test of details, we need to be auditing certain documents. If this is related to expenditures, we're going to be looking at purchase orders. If it has to do with revenue, we're going to look at sales orders. We need those documents available. We need an agreement of management to inform the auditor of any subsequent events, right? So after we have come to our conclusion as of year end and something immediately afterwards occurs, like say the settlement of pending litigation, that's something that we need to understand. We need to let management know that it's their responsibility to tell us about it. Fees and billing arrangements, all right? So we need to include in the engagement letter how much this is going to cost the client. Right. This isn't for free. We need to know how much we're getting paid, and it needs to be signed and agreed upon. Arrangements concerning the involvement of other auditors, specialists, internal auditors, and other staff of the entity. Okay, so if we're bringing on other specialists or we're going to use the client's internal audit team, that's something that should be disclosed in this letter as well. Okay, so if we are arranging to speak with the predecessor auditor, disclosing that we need to make this arrangement is something that should be made. We should disclose any restrictions on the auditor's liability any obligations of the auditor to provide audit documentation to other parties. Okay, so if there's a subpoena or summons, we remember we have to disclose this client information even without their permission. All right, this is us letting them know, hey, heads up, if something like this comes up, we're going to have to disclose your information. All right, and just any additional services to be provided or references to further agreements between the auditor and the client also needs to be disclosed. Okay, so at the end of the day, this is the list of what is actually written in the engagement letter. It all makes sense. All of this stuff is relatively intuitive. Okay, so understanding that this is the contract for actually conducting the audit itself is what you need to understand when thinking about the context. All right, so the next question we need to ask ourselves within our mental map. We need to understand some of the different reasons that would be considered acceptable and what would be considered unacceptable for changing the audit engagement, all right? So this is something that the exam loves to test. 
All right, so ultimately discussing whether or not we are downgrading from an audit to something else, right? Something like a review or an agreed upon procedure engagement or compilation, right? So if we are changing from something with positive assurance to something with much less assurance. And some of the acceptable reasons for making these changes are going to be for things like due to changes in requirements. Okay, maybe initially the client needed to get an audit report in order to borrow money. But now the bank is saying, actually, you just need a review engagement. All right, we don't need that much assurance. Okay, so another acceptable reason could be due to misunderstandings between the client and the auditor regarding the services that are to be rendered. Okay, so maybe at first we interpreted this as needing much more assurance. All right, so maybe in previous years, the client needed an audit conducted. Okay, but this year, they're not going to need as much. So there was some misunderstanding. Maybe we assumed that the same engagement was going to be necessary this year. Turns out it's not. That is an acceptable reason for a revision in the engagement letter. All right, so what are some unacceptable reasons to make revisions to the engagement letter? Let's think intuitively here. We're following rules by a professional standard setting body. All right, so intuitively, what would they not accept? If we were making changes because fraud or error has been uncovered by the auditor, and we go back to Max at a Cruel World, and Detective Lucy says, hey, we found some fraud going on here, what's up with this? And Max over at a Cruel World is like, whoa, 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 turns out we actually just need a review now. All right, that is unacceptable. We can't just downgrade this report and the level of assurance because a report with much more assurance is going to indicate that fraud has been uncovered. That would obviously be misleading to the financial statement readers. Okay, so another unacceptable reason would be if the client has attempted to create misleading or deceptive financial statements, obviously. All right, so as you can see, both of these are very shady. And downgrading or changing the terms of the engagement because something shady has come up, obviously going to be unacceptable. All right, so take a step back. This stuff isn't that crazy challenging to remember. No need to memorize this. Just think logically. Think intuitively. If you do that, this is going to make sense. 